Dobrodoče na novu epizodu BP Podcast. Marinu smo dali slobodan dan. Ja vodim današnju emisiju i super mi je što ne moram paziti na padeže. Naime, imamo posebne goste iz SAD-a. Uskoro ćete ih poznati. Oni su iz Michigana, Savjezna država Michigan. Um, Tony Bozan i Patrick Rice. Guys, welcome to Croatia. Thank welcome you, Father. Croatia. Thank First time you, in Father. Croatia. First time. It's my first time in Croatia. It's my first time in Europe. Really? It's a beautiful country. Okay. And I'm just honored to be here. Excellent. Yes, yeah, thank you. Second time for me. Second time. Okay. Yeah. Um, just before we, before we get into the topic, um, when I, you know, you know, we, as kids, we used to play the game of association with words. You just say a word and what comes to mind. When I say, when you hear the word Croatia, what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Beauty. Beauty. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, the coast. I mean, I've just heard about okay. the sea here, the mountains. It's just beautiful. Okay, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, welcome. Welcome to Croatia, uh, to Zagreb. Um, and, and it's great having you guys here. Um, okay, we want to talk. We just want to get to know you guys. So let, I just, you know, if you could just introduce yourselves to say shortly who you are, where do you come from, what did you do, what did you study, what do you do now? So, sure. um, Patrick? Yeah, I'm uh, Patrick Rice. I'm uh, the co-founder and executive director of Encounter Ministries located in the Diocese of Lansing in Brighton, Michigan. And I have married to, uh, my wife is named Emily. We met at college at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Steubenville. Okay. We graduated in 2006 and now we have six kids. Six kids. From 15 to two mm -hmm. and it's boy, girl, 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 boy. Okay. So it's bookends. So how old is the oldest child? Oldest is 15 right and now. the youngest? Is two. So you get a lot of sleep, eh? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Okay. Uh, Tony? Yes. Um, so I grew up in Michigan. Um, I, uh, I'm a physician. Um, I'm a general surgeon. So my training, I, I went to the University of Michigan where I studied biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to Michigan State University where I got my medical doctorate. Now I work as a surgeon uh, at a Catholic um, health system called Trinity Health in Michigan. Um, and uh, as a surgeon, I, I focus on minimally invasive surgery. So that's okay. sort of big abdominal operations with small incisions. I use the, the robotic system. Um, and um, I'm very busy. I, I do between 15 and 25 procedures a week. Wow. And then I have some administrative okay. pers um, re responsibilities as well, mm -hmm. kind of oversee, um, uh, you know, about 100 or, or 150 physicians in our organization with others. Um, but um, more importantly, um, my family. I'm, um, you know, I'm married to my wife, Danielle. We've been married for 15 years now. We've got five kids. Five kids, okay. Um, my oldest Wonderful. is 13, Alexandra. And then my son, Benjamin, is 11. And then Genevieve is is nine, and then Charlotte is four, and, and Henry is two. So we have a pretty robust and busy home life, which is which is great. Okay, well, I thank your wives for letting you guys <laughs> yeah. come. Yeah. I thank your wives for letting you guys come to this trip in Croatia. Okay, you guys are here. Uh, you guys were invited by our uh, prayer community, Božja Pobjeda, our charismatic um, Catholic prayer community, and you mentioned encounter. Mm -hmm. Encounter ministry, so it's a new term here. Not a lot of people mm -hmm. know about it. I've watched a couple of uh, YouTube videos um, about your ministry. I read a little bit about that. So maybe if you guys want to just say what is Encounter, and I assume the two of you met through Encounter yeah, and they worked right. together. So maybe just just say what what is the Encounter ministry? How did it begin? When did it begin? And what do you guys do? Yeah, Encounter Ministries exist to unleash the transforming power of the Holy Spirit okay. into the world. And to that end, we, we, we're teaching ministry. We teach, equip, and activate disciples to demonstrate the love of God through the power of the Holy Spirit in the world around them, in their sphere of influence. So our, our, we, do a lot, we have a lot of elements of our ministry. We have a, a worship ministry. We have an inner healing ministry. But our biggest ministry is our Encounter School of Ministry. Okay. It's a two-year formation program for any disciple who wants to make Jesus known in the world around them, to grow in the gifts and the life and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we cover eight quarters of content throughout two years. We have a main campus in our home in Brighton, Michigan. It's St. Patrick's. And we have 23 satellite campuses, mostly in the U.S. now, Canada, Mexico, and Australia. And then we have an online campus for anyone that doesn't have access to an on-site campus 
and we have 1,200 students in our online campus. So it's a very robust network of people that are being trained to basically live out John 14, 12. Jesus promised, amen, amen, if you believe in me, you'll do the works that I do and greater things because I'm going to the Father. So anyone that, that sees the promises of Jesus mm -hmm. and wants to make bring them alive in their life, especially in the supernatural ministry that Jesus modeled, that's what we create an opportunity to form and train them in. Wonderful. And Tony was one of our first students. Okay. He went through with his wife. You should tell him about your experience. Yeah. Um, well, um, I grew up as, I would call it a cradle Catholic. So, you know, I went to church every week. Um, we regularly did confession, the sacraments, that kind of thing. But I wasn't really um, exposed to um, sort of the evangelical side of um, Catholicism. In fact, it was very, very new to me when I came, first came in contact with Encounter. Um, I, remember, I remember my wife and I, we would, we would pretty regularly do, um, you know, prayer groups, um, Bible studies, that kind of thing. Um, but one day um, in the fall of 2017, you know, my wife had sort of uh, encountered this um, this group called Encounter Ministries online. And there was a conference um, that was upcoming. And uh, she asked if I wanted to go. And I said, sure, you know, if that's important to you, it's important to me, and let's, let's, let's do this. But as it got a little bit closer, to be honest with you, I wasn't as really excited to go because it was a long weekend, long days, and it was just sort of, you know, with just the busyness of life, I, I just sort of wasn't, I wasn't really excited about it. But, you know, I got to the, um, the conference, and some of the things that I saw were very, very new to me, very foreign to me, very unusual to me. And it took, um, it took a while for me to understand what was going on. Um, but over the course of time, um, I think the Holy Spirit really, you know, opened so what my... What was going on? What, what, what uh, grabbed <laughs> your attention you know, as a cradle Catholic coming yeah. to a Catholic ministry, like encounters yeah. a Catholic, yeah. What, what, what got your attention? What kind of shocked you? Well, I saw things that I hadn't seen before, right? Okay. I saw people that were speaking in tongues. Okay. I saw people that were sort of doing these things with their arms, their bodies. I just was not comfortable with it. It wasn't my, it wasn't my style. It wasn't what, I was, what I'd done. And I saw some people that had fallen on the floor and just, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, what is going on here? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So, <laughs> and so, um, I, honestly, I was thinking, these are very dramatic people that are looking for attention. That was what I'd that kind was your of, first impression. That was my okay. conclusion. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, you know, and so I felt as though I were an anthropologist, sort of like a fly on the wall, just watching all this go on. And um, I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was seeing and experiencing because it was so new to me. It was so, it was so unusual. But Father Matthias, who is one of the co-founders with Patrick okay. of Encounter, mm -hmm. um, during this conference, he invited the people. Um, to just ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Just whatever, whatever God wants for you, just open yourself. Open your heart, open your mind. And um, I was sitting in this chair, in the, in the pew in the church, and uh, the, the church that we were at was called uh, Christ the King. And uh, at the front of the church, there's a large cross with the corpus of Jesus. Um, it was just sort of part of, of, of the church. It was, it was a very central part of the church. And I was sitting there sort of praying in, or in my mind thinking, what do I believe? What do I really believe? And so I'm sort of going through it. And I believe in God, which is an important start. You know, I, and it was basically the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is, you know, what we do at Mass every week. The Apostles' Creed. Yeah. The Apostles' Creed. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I believe these things are real. So what's, so I basically said, Jesus, I'm having a hard time with this in my mind, but I open myself up to whatever it is that you want for me. Come, I invite you to come into my heart, come into my life. That was my prayer. That was it. And so I'm sitting there praying, and there's music, and I look up at this cross, at the corpus of Christ, 
and I saw these rays of light that were coming from his heart, much like the divine mercy. And at that time, I felt myself being pushed back in my seat in the chair. And it was a, a, just a very warm feeling that had sort of filled me. And it was almost like if I were on a passenger plane at the time of takeoff, as yeah. the plane is accelerating and I'm being pushed back in my chair. Or if there was a way to take a chair and sort of attach it to the bottom of a river so that it wouldn't move. And then you sit in that chair and you feel the water sort of pushing past you. It was it was not unpleasant, but it was unsettling. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was very strange. And it lasted, I mean, it lasted for quite a while. And then after a period of time, it stopped. Of course, I didn't say anything to my wife or anyone else. I'm just sort of trying to process everything that's going on. Um, and then later on in the, um, in the conference, um, there was further prayer, individual prayer teams that were praying over people. And there was sort of a long line that had formed to be individually prayed over. And of course, I, I didn't get in line because I didn't feel like I, <laughs> I'm like, I'll just stay back in the, you know, I'll just watch what's happening. Well, there was this, uh, this group that was, um, that was sort of moving through, praying with people, and they sort of caught my eye. I caught their eye, and they started coming over towards me, and I'm thinking, oh, no. You know, how do I get out of this? <laughs> and they asked me, can, can we pray over you? And, uh, and I said, okay, all right, you can. You know. um, and so they're not touching me. They're just holding their hands up, and they're praying over me. And um, they're just asking for the Holy Spirit to come. It's a very simple prayer. And I was just trying to, again, open myself. And in my mind, I said, God, just whatever you want to do for me, I receive. I have no expectations here, but I invite you to come. And that was it. And then I felt myself being pushed again, much like before. And, you know, I, again, seen all these people on the ground, you know, sort of laying down in the, on the floor. And um, I thought, I don't want to go down on the floor. You don't want to do, <laughs> you don't I mean, do that. <laughs> first off, <laughs> it's not my style. Second off, uh, I'm sure the floor is dirty. Third, um, it's kind of embarrassing. And yeah. fourth, I mean, just I want no part of this. And so, of course, I started pushing back. And then, and then I felt at that point that I was being pushed harder. And so I start pushing back hard. I have this struggle within me. And, you know, these guys are praying. And then all of a sudden, the one guy sort of starts laughing. And he tells the other person on the prayer team, he's, he's pushing back, you know. And they ask me, why are you, why are you fighting this? Why are you resisting? Why are you resisting? Yeah. And then I thought, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. And then I just let go. And, I mean, again, this is not my style. This is not... My thing, but I, I go down on the ground. And I'm, the minute I go down, I'm immediately flooded by the most profound peace and joy that I've ever experienced in my wow. entire life. Mm -hmm. And I was down for 10, 15 minutes. Now, you were conscious of everything, what was going I was on. You conscious. heard everything. Yeah. I could hear everything, yeah. yet I was almost like somewhere else. It was did, a, you, did you feel at that time where you're lying down that, that you could get up at any time? Or? I could. Oh, okay, yeah. I could okay, get up important. at any yeah. time, but I didn't yeah. want to. That's it. That's it. I didn't yeah. want. I'm just I'm sort of receiving. Yeah. So that, that's the phenomenon. There's several expressions. Reposing in the spirit, slain exactly. in the spirit, resting in the yes. spirit. So that's that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so and then, yeah. prior to this weekend, I had never seen anything like that happen. Yeah. And I was not really looking for that to happen. I, I don't know. I didn't want, honestly, I didn't really want that to happen. But once it happened, I was profoundly yeah, grateful. I, I, think, I think that's a natural reaction. I mean, yeah. coming from my experience too, I, I, I'm a cradle Catholic, grew mm -hmm. up in a very traditional classical Catholic household, you know, mass, fasting yeah. and yeah. prayer and everything. And when I encountered similar stuff, 
as a priest. I yeah. was like, no, man, uh, it's yeah. not for me, man. That's right. Um, but I think that's natural. I think that yeah. that's a phase we have to yeah. um, go through. Um, I'd like to get back to you, Patrick. Uh, okay, um, in terms of encounter, so you came to an encounter ministry meeting, okay? Mm -hmm. can, can you just say how, you've mentioned Father Matthias. Mm -hmm. um, is that correct, Matthias? Father Matthias. Matthias, okay. Um, how did how did how did this happen? How did the encounter begin? What happened? Uh, um, when did it begin? Yeah. So I mean, we it, it's I would say the fruit of friendship okay. and common dreams together. We met in 2011 at a uh, an Unbound training conference unbound. led by okay. Neil and Janet Lozano. Yeah, they're present here. The Unbound yeah. Ministry is present here in Croatia. Yeah, it's okay. incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so we met at that conference. I was a youth minister. I just finished my first year and um, Father Matthias was finishing his first year of priesthood and we were at the conference, he was from Michigan, I was living in Ohio at the time and we met and once we, we met we just instantly connected on a friendship level. We were getting equipped to participate more fully in the, uh, you know, a, an element of the deliverance ministry and we were seeing profound breakthrough receiving prayer and, and leading others in prayer for that. Okay. And then we prayed over each other um, at, toward the end and just had phenomenal encounter with the Holy Spirit through prophetic words for one another and just committed that we're going to stay friends, you know, beyond this weekend. So that went on and he, we, would, we would continue to stay in contact together. And we started to see how profound it was to be normal Catholics, especially, uh, you know, I was a lay person, he was a priest, but he didn't receive any practical training in prayer ministry in the uh, seminary in the seminary well, nothing new there man. and so um <laughs> okay. we saw the the tremendous need for that and then throughout after that experience i started um i met a, a couple a catholic couple that was formerly pentecostal that became catholic okay and they were the most prophetic people i had ever met just all of the prophetic gifts of spirit discernment of spirits words of knowledge prophecy uh, words of wisdom were just dripping in it and they uh, they offered to disciple uh, my wife and I and several other couples and Father Matthias to some degree in a, a series of conferences where we were really trained and poured into to grow in our the prophetic gifts of the Spirit and then Father Matthias through the uh, in a big part the uh, in influence of Damien Stain from the United Kingdom okay. mm -hmm. and Dr mm -hmm. Mary Healy yeah. and also Dr Randy Clark um, who's part of a ministry called Global Awakening really poured into us um, for to grow in healing ministry. And we saw profound, profound things. We did healing services all over the United States, uh, especially in the Midwest at that time. And uh, we, we felt this call throughout the midst of doing ministry to be involved in training others for ministry. And so that's where the Encounter School of Ministry was born, which we started together in 2017. 2017. Uh, the, school, the, the ministry was formed in 2016 been very fast. We were actually featured in a documentary uh, by a Catholic, American Catholic documentary filmmaker named Maura Smith, who um, wanted to do a documentary on the Holy Spirit involved in evangelization in the American Catholic Church and called Renewal Ministries, a, a large Catholic uh, mm -hmm. charismatic uh, organization asking, who's doing this? And we were very new at the time. And they said, oh, you got to go. Um, you got to meet Father Matthias and Patrick and follow Encounter Ministry. So she was. She came and documented one of our healing services, some of our power evangelization outings. We would. We're very passionate about going out on the street and uh, meeting people where they are and demonstrating the love of God in the way that they need it, mm -hmm. leading them closer to Christ. So that film came out. Uh, Father and I were both featured in that, and that really helped kind of expose what we were doing on a broader level. So we started doing conferences, and then we launched our, our school in 2017. So you guys are based in Michigan, and mm -hmm. Father Matthias is a priest of the diocese. He's of, a yeah, he's a diocesan priest of Lansing mm -hmm. the diocese, right? And and you guys, if I can understand well, you equip other people yeah to with the gospel, with the gospel evangelization, and then they go off um, in their um, areas where they live, and they continue. Um, yeah, and so the, the the once again the mission statement is from the richness of our Catholic heritage okay. and identity, we teach, equip, and activate disciples to demonstrate the love of God through the holy power of the Holy Spirit in their spheres of influence. So wherever you have influence, you have mission. Okay. Whether it's your, your first, your family, mm -hmm. your work, your parish, your community, uh, wherever you are, that's your mission territory. 
And the, the issue is not, Emma, do I have a, a mission and a ministry? It's, am I equipped to do these things? And St. Paul talked about the, um, the role of the church equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. That although we, we are disciples, we believe, it doesn't mean that we're mature. And so we've created an apparatus to do long-term, evan- to do long-term formation to equip people to make Jesus known. We do, our first quarter is on identity and transformation. Okay. So you have to know who you are, mm-hmm. whose you are, and then to start, um, to, the renewal of the mind is a big theme in that quarter, to think from heaven's perspective, not from a worldly human perspective. Our second quarter is on hearing God's voice, the prophetic gifts of the Holy Spirit, where uh, we, we want to give our students an opportunity to really grow in understanding the language of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit, his first language is not Croatian. Uh, well. And it's not even English. <laughs> it's, it's, it's internal. Uh, it's through the spiritual faculties. Um, and so we, we, we talk about the spiritual internal faculties that we have. And they give students an opportunity to, to grow in that. And then for them to realize that the gift of prophecy is, and the prophetic gifts are God speaking to, to, to others through you to build them up, encourage them, and strengthen them. And it's a lot of practical hands-on. It's learning about the way that the gifts of the Spirit operate, and then having a safe environment to carry them out. And uh, the third quarter is on power and healing, physical healing. Okay. And so we're, we're, you know, healing is actually Jesus' idea. He said, these signs will accompany those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And so for us, we're very serious about that. Healing is not an optional command. Yeah, and so mm-hmm. we're very passionate. Jesus said, you know, go make disciples of all nations teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And, uh, and the role of the participation in healing ministry is actually one of Jesus' commands, commands multiple yeah. times in Matthew 28, right? Matthew, Matthew 28, 28 yeah. also Mark chapter, or sorry, Matthew chapter 10, preach the gospel as you go, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Um, these signs will accompany those who believe. He imparted the Matthew 10, 1, authority over unclean spirits and over all diseases and infirmities. And so we're very passionate about uh, equipping normal Catholics to participate more fully in that, uh, that ministry of healing, which is in the context of preaching the gospel. And our fourth quarter is on inner healing and freedom, that Jesus actually wants us free from the influence of demonic, the demonic, uh, mm-hmm. demonic influence. And also not just uh, deliverance stuff, but healing of, of hearts, that um, Psalm 147 verse three, reveals God as the Lord who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And, where, you know, if I go to you for confession, yeah, you I'm telling you, yeah. I'm saying, Father, I need forgiveness for the, the things I've done to others. But what about the things that the others have done to me? I, that's not, you know, I, don't, I can't get yeah, forgiven for yeah, them. So yeah. there's, there's a, a place where the people of God need to help other people um, let go of all those burdens, bring Jesus to the darkest places of the heart. And so we equip our students to participate in that inner healing of the heart that brings freedom. Yeah. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. You know, you mentioned confession. I, I, I as a priest, I'm a priest of 20 years, and um, it, it, it happens a lot. That, you know, people come to confession, they confess their sins, and, and you know, the, the, these wounds remain either what people did to them or they experienced the, the consequences of their sins. And that, that's where in the ministry, where a lot of times we priests are lacking, you know, we give them sacramental absolution, um, but it still hurts. Patrick, what I wanna ask right now, um, okay, so you guys, uh, you, uh, Tony, had this experience at, an, at, a, at a, um, conference. At a conference, uh, and then you, met Father Matthias at the Neo Lozano conference. The, yeah, the about Unbound. Okay. almost 10 years ago. Just before. very shortly, what, okay, Unbound is very known in Croatia. Yeah. What would be the difference or the similarities between what Unbound is doing and what Encounter Ministries is doing? Yeah, very, yeah it's awesome. Unbound is, is passionate about equipping normal Catholics to do deliverance ministry. Okay, okay. And has, a, has the faith that anyone, can, anyone with, with a passionate heart to bring freedom uh, can do this. And so... In the same way, we have a passion and, a, and a, a passion and a calling to see others equipped for all elements of supernatural ministry, not just deliverance. In our fourth quarter on inner healing and freedom, we actually pull a lot from the ministry principles and uh, content from Unbound, but we expand it to other what we call modalities. So Unbound is giving a, a five, um, 
the five, the five keys, keys. The five yep. keys are, mm -hmm. are well, we would consider that one modality, but there's other modalities like um, theophostic or transformational prayer ministry. There's, uh, so we're, we're bringing what we consider the best modalities for inner healing and freedom that we're training our students in. Wow, okay, wonderful things. Now, what I wanna get into now a bit, what I wanna talk about now is the um, healing, yeah. okay, physical healing. Um, and you know, I think it's great that we have a doctor here, okay, just in case anything happens here, we have someone here, but um, it's gonna be great, Tony, to get back to you regarding um, the complementary com uh, medical healing, that you know, the, the medical healing and supernatural healing, but first I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the theology of healing. Uh, okay, I'm a priest. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm a priest of 20 years, and um, I'll speak from personal experience. I, I personally believe what uh, what says in the gospel that the, the the disciples, the apostles healed Jesus healed people. The disciples in His name got the mandate to do that, and they're doing that. And I also believe that you know certain saints, not certain, many saints in history. Are, Saint John Bosco did some healings also. I'm a Salesian of Don Bosco. Um, but I'll be honest, I was very um, cautious and apprehensive about heal, um, praying for someone's healing. Or deep down, I'll, I'll be honest, it's my weakness. I kind of feel like, oh man, what, what, if, what, if, what if nothing happens? You know? <laughs> what if nothing happens? What's gonna happen? I mean, it's gonna be, it's just gonna fall apart, you know? And it says in the gospel, it should happen. Jesus did that. Jesus gave us the mandate to do that. I'm consecrated, I was ordained, I'm, a, I'm an ordained priest. Um, so I have, I'll be honest. That, There's no excuses for you then. I know, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody else. So it's a huge, but I'll be honest, it's yeah. a huge barrier, not only for me, for a lot of priests, you know, we're going to pray generally for some, which is good. We'll pray for inner healing, but with the physical healing, I, I always had a block yet, you know, what if nothing happens, you know, I, mm -hmm. so I ought not to do that, you know, because I don't want to embarrass myself. Um, so anyways, just when you read the gospel, we're 2,000 years away from when it was written and when Jesus walked this earth. Do healings still happen? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Because Jesus is actually not dead. He's alive. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So healings happen. Yeah. Okay. Because he's alive. Okay. Why? Just, I'm, I'm going to just get right into it. Why, why is it that, you know, I have a hard time when people come and they have cancer or infertility is a huge problem and I'll be, I pray now for healing. I pray for people. And, you know, a lot of times it's just nothing happens. What, what, and why is that so? Well, can I, let's bring it back to the gospel. Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. So do you remember the story of the father that brought his son to, uh, to the disciples okay. and then to Jesus? And he, he brought them, you know, because his son was having epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he comes to Jesus and he said, hey, I brought my my son has absolute epilepsy. Your disciples couldn't do anything for him. Okay. And so what was Jesus' response? Bring him here to me. And the, uh, he, he ended up, he, was, he came for physical healing from epilepsy, and Jesus actually led a deliverance prayer. He cast out an evil spirit that was causing the affliction, the ep epilepsy. And the, the son, you know, collapsed on the floor, and then he, he, was, and then he was healed totally. Mm -hmm. And then, so there's, there's something that happens when people don't get healed, there could be a temptation. Well, I guess Jesus doesn't want to heal me. But if that father who first went to the, to the disciples, they weren't healed of the disciples' prayer, if he would have given up. But he didn't give up. He persevered, and then he went to Jesus. And did, 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 did Jesus say, oh, the disciples already did their best, gave it, gave it a good crack, nothing happened. I don't think the father wants to heal you today. No, that he actually ministered and prayed. So when healing doesn't happen, we have to go to Jesus directly. And because, you know, sometimes the disciples of Jesus can let us down. That sometimes it's, it's not, you know, it, it, it's our problem because there's a block that we have that's, you know, it's not happening. So there's a multiplicity so, of reasons. Yeah. But then mm -hmm. there's the disciples themselves after that, they come to Jesus and they, they see that I prayed, nothing happened. But when you, when you prayed and you did this, he was healed. Why couldn't we see it? And then Jesus gives them this response. It's because of your little faith. He, he, the most pastoral response. Can you imagine that? Like yeah. you, would, you would probably get removed from your priesthood if probably. you told someone, in trouble, your healing ministry is not that great because <laughs> you don't have enough faith, son. Like, yeah. But this is what Jesus did. And, and, and it was not, it, it was love. Everything was about love with Jesus. And so 
Jesus went on to say, it's, um, uh, you know, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll, you'll see it. But, you know, these only come out with prayer and fasting. And then there's, there's some lessons that can be made. There was, does that mean I need to pray and fast more to see the healing or the deliverance? And if we make it about the things that we do for God, then it becomes a work. We cannot earn the healing. What's the purpose of prayer and fasting? Increases our faith. When I, when I pray and I connect God and I, and I connect with God, what do I do? I hear his voice. And where does faith come from? Romans 10, 13, faith comes through hearing, hearing from the word of God. So prayer, the object of prayer is connecting with his voice. And when I hear his voice, then it, it increases my faith to do the supernatural. And fasting, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, I want to be, I'm more hungry to be used by you than for food itself. That, that's an incredible act of faith. And so Jesus is teaching them his way, which is a way of faith. Mm-hmm. Only, only doing what he saw the Father doing, only saying what he heard the Father saying. And he's saying, guys, the reason you're not effective is because there's still more for you. Okay. Um, one other thing there. Um, I believe, I believe um, Jesus Christ came and in his first proclamation in Luke's gospel to um, heal the brokenhearted and, and everything. But... Um, now I'm playing the devil's advocate a little bit, God forgive me. Yeah. Um, when Jesus rose and he ascended into heaven and after Pentecost, okay, sickness remained. Okay, and what if someone says, okay, I went to Jesus and healing again did not happen. Yeah. Okay, I, I remember a witness that I listened to Sister Bridge McKenna and she was at a conference and this really got me thinking uh, through her witness. And she was very big, I think, in the healing ministry, and especially with priests she works. And she once saw a young priest, about 30 years old. He just became a priest, and he, 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 got a, a, he, he became quadriplegic. I don't know what happened to him, but his arms were all twisted and suffering a lot. And, you know, she was at a conference just looking at him. She, she, in her heart, she's like, oh, Jesus, why, why is this happening? He's a young priest, you know? And she starts praying for him. And then deep down, she, she just got some insight. You know, it was an inspiration. She goes, as if Jesus was telling her, you know, I am allowing this for a greater good. And he is going to save more souls through his prayer and his um, suffering. You know, and so I, I found that to be very interesting. So mm-hmm. h- how, do you, how do you kind of um, walk through that? Like, it's a balance between yeah. Jesus, his, he set this example of, of physical healing okay. to confirm his message. And then there's the reality of not everyone gets healed. Yeah. So the church has given us this awesome um, theology called redemptive suffering, that we're in the, a- in the absence of physical healing, we can actually offer up our suffering, whether it's emotional, spiritual, and physical, to him as an offering and see, and see grace flow from that. Because Romans 8, 28, God works the good for all things for those who love him, so uh, in the absence of, of healing, I can offer up my pain, infirmity, all of those things, and expect, like, like Sister Breege was receiving revelation from, God to bring amazing grace through that. Does that mean I should stop praying for God to heal me? I don't think so. Yeah, exactly. I don't I think so. I agree. Um, there is a story here. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to uh, talk about this book. This is called um, Supernatural Saints. It's a book I just wrote about ministry lessons on all of these supernatural ministry stuff that we love and encounter from six saints. And there's a story of um, St. Philip Neri, who uh, he's, he was the, uh, they call him the Apostle of Rome. He started 16th the century. Oratory, 16th oratory. century. Uh, sorry, if I just I'm going to throw myself in oh, with, please. with a footnote. Uh, Philip Neri founded the Oratory in Rome, and our founder, St. John Bosco, was inspired by him. So we, we have oh, a yeah. lot of devotion to Philip Neri. And he's known for his humor also. He's the Apostle yeah. of Joy. That's it, that's it. He would yeah. actually put, he, he did a lot of pranks too that are very influential. Oh, yeah. 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 I heard, I read somewhere, he'd wake up every morning and he'd look at and goes, God, be careful because maybe Philip's going to betray you today. <laughs> that's what he used to say every morning when he used to get up. Okay, so you were saying? So he was, he was very known for, uh, for his healing ministry. There's countless stories of healing. His disciples that became, he had disciples that were, uh, younger priests that followed him. They wrote biographies of him. Uh, Father Bacci, Father Galonio. And so we have all these firsthand accounts from eyewitnesses that, that would actually recount the ways he prayed and kind of his process. So the, the, the process that he used, the very nuts and bolts, is what inspires us to encounter as we're pursuing 
healing ministry. We have a whole, we have 2,000 years of saints yeah. that have actually been doing the works of Jesus mm -hmm. that we can learn from and get greater wisdom. We don't have to invent it ourselves. We get to, you know, walk on their shoulders. And Philip Neary, he was always, he would always, if someone said, I want to, can you please come pray for me? He would always come and pray for healing, but he cared more about the health of their soul than their body. And there's a story that I, that I want to share about, but it's about mm -hmm. that. There is a a man that was dying and uh, his wife called Philip Neary and said, come pray for him. And he had healed so many people that were on their deathbed. Um, it was very common. And in, in the account, he, uh, he later recounted that when he went to pray for healing, he felt, quote, almost deprived of the power to pray. And he shifted into to leading the man in repentance, repentance. forgiveness, confession, mm -hmm. And he went through all of the spiritual things to make sure he was right with God. The man died like a day later. Okay. And, uh, and it's, it's an example. Death is the ultimate reality for all of us. Even, um, even uh, um, Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, died again. he died again. So all physical healing is yeah. temporary. temporary. It is a sign that points to the reality that Jesus is alive. It's a resurrection sign that when your shoulder's not working, and we pray for you, and it can work again. It's like a, something that was dead came back to life. It's a sign that when you die, you're going to come back to life if you choose to believe, follow, and, and you know, follow Jesus. I read a wonderful um, commentary on that. Say healings that are happening happening in the world today in, in dr during the this era of history the, of the militant church, the pilgrim church. Those are that's penetrations of the of the kingdom in time and space, but when we come before God, at the end of time, we're gonna look God face to face. And there'll be no more tears, there'll be no sickness. Um, I wanna cross over to Tony a little bit, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tony. Um, I'm so happy to have a doctor here um, because um, I think it's great we're talking about this because I, th there seems to be a great disparity between you know uh, medical, um, medical research and uh, the medical field and supernatural healing I know priests mm -hmm. who will say, you know, oh, you know, just go to the doctor and, and they, they will not pray for healing. I'm thinking God gave us medicine. And that's where the miracles happen. The, the fact that we have this technology and everything. So, so Tony, Dr. Tony, as a, as a doctor, can you um, say, how do you, how do you uh, reconcile these two things? Right. And from a medical point of view, how do you um, comment on the, right. the supernatural healing? Yeah, so, um, so I'm a big fan of, um, of hospital, you know, actual mainstream medicine. That's what I do. And for me to um, kind of grow in this um, prayer, prayerful physical healing, it's been a journey, to be honest with you. Because initially, you know, just getting back to leaving this conference that I was talking about, I, my worldview was, was changed. And there were a lot of people from our parish that were at this conference that experienced very similar, I don't want to say troubling, but just very unusual things. And so I remember we had about 40 or 50 people come over to our house um, that were at this conference. And we just sort of started to unpack what we'd seen and what we'd experienced. And so we were just sharing these, um, these stories of what we'd seen. And over time, um, you know, I, I, my wife and I, we, we, um, we joined the Encounter School of Ministry the next year, actually that fall. And it was hard for me. It was really hard because that was not how I was trained. It was not how, um, how I grew up. But my prayer was very basic. It was, God, show me truth. Help me to see the world in a way that would please you. Help, help affect my worldview so that I can know you better. That was it. And I tried over the two-year um, uh, series of classes through Encounter Ministry to learn how to be docile to the Holy Spirit. And part of it was being child, honestly being childlike and going to God and saying, just show me. Um, and as I did that, I began to see these things that were unmistakable. Um, and if I didn't witness these things myself, I would have a really hard time believing it. Yeah. I really would. 
And um, these were verifiable things, medically verifiable healings. And um, part of my training in medical school, um, I don't want to say I had to set aside, but I had to join this new sort of way to look at healing because they're very complementary. I spent the first, I would say, half of my life, you know, deep in the sciences, you know, deep in um, medical journals, um, just the scientific method. Um, and as I go through the second half of my life, I'm very interested in philosophy, theology, and I think they're extraordinarily complementary. It's, it's interesting to me how some people will feel that sciences and you know, religion are dichotomous. They're two ends of a spectrum that are not able to be... Can't reconcile them. That yet. are unable well, to be reconciled. That, yeah. But as, yeah. as I kind of, you know, try to, try to learn what God is trying to say, and as I read and I try to understand the more I realize how absolutely complementary they are and how you can't have one without the other. Yeah. Now, doctor, um, can, you, can you give us some concrete um, examples, witnesses, um, something that you saw with your own eyes? Like sure. medically, there was sure. no way out, yeah. and then the supernatural happened. Can you sure. give us two or three examples maybe? Well, I know of you know, people who have been colorblind, their entire lives that have had prayer and then they can see color and they they're tested and it's something that they've never experienced before and no from medical that, explanation no medical yeah. explanation at all wow i mean how how do i and you know part of it is i have a couple of other examples but um i've been spending um just in prayer there there's a new um I don't know if you've heard of the James Webb Telescope. This was no, uh, no. this was uh, a telescope that had been launched into space Christmas of 2021, mm -hmm. and it's um, it it reached its point in space and deployed, um, I, I believe, in in July of this year. And over the past several months, there have been some images that have been sent back to Earth, and um, the images of deep space, these galaxies, they're they're unbelievable, they're beautiful. And I look at these images and I'm just overwhelmed by the unbelievable, majestic beauty of God's creation. And I look at these things and I think, God did this, God created this. Um, he made the heavens and the earth. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why, but he loves us. He loves us in such a reckless way that he's yeah. willing to have sent his, his only son to die for us. And so this, this person who created these things, somehow I'm going to say that he can and can't do certain things, such as healing, such as these, these gifts that he wants to give us. Um, and so I ask myself, am I sort of putting God in a box to kind of um, say what he can and can't do? And I guess that's, that's what I've learned to do is just to approach it with humility. Mm -hmm. And then with that, I allow God to lead. And I see these things that occur. I mean, people that have had chronic problems, um, I mean, one after another after another, completely healed. I'll see them months and months later, and they say, you know, that night changed my life. That night I was prayed over, my yeah. life was changed. Well, that was, I was going to ask you that, doctor. Um, okay, so you're a doctor that, if I understood well, you work at a Catholic hospital? Correct. Okay. Yeah. You're part of Encounter Ministries. Now, as a doctor and a patient comes to you, mm -hmm. um, obviously you give them all the medical treatment mm -hmm. that science can offer and the medical mm -hmm. field could offer. Um, what do you do concretely as a doctor there? Do you pray within yourself? Do you let this person know I'm going to pray for you? Or, or do you refer him to the team um, at Encounter Mysteries? How do you go about doing that? Kind of all three. Okay. Um, I'll often pray over patients um, Just without them with, yeah, okay. really knowing. Okay. Um, but 
I'm sort of prompted by the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so when I feel that the Holy Spirit is asking, I'll pray with people out loud. But I'll, it's, it's a sensitive thing. I mean, some people are really open to that. Some people really aren't. And so the ones that are, I will pray with and over. Um, I've certainly sent um, folks to, um, to learn and uh, reach out to Encounter Ministries for further, you know, just healing understanding. Service healing service, healing yeah. service yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, the things that I've seen um, really reinforce what God wants to do in our lives. Okay, I'm going back to the examples. What would be the example uh, that you saw in the last little while of a healing um, that, that really, you know, was unbelievable? So I've seen people that have had cancer okay. that have had images, uh, CT scans that have been done that shown tumor throughout, you know, various aspects of the body. Healing was done. Repeat images show no cancer, which is unbelievable. It's spectacular, and the, the the medical specialists have no. That that was I was going to ask you that. Now you work at a Catholic hospital. Oh, I assume that most of the doctors are Catholic, or at least sympathetic to the Catholic faith, and accept um, to a certain degree our teachings. Did you ever experience that one of your colleagues, doctors, who, who was maybe agnostic or atheist or or lukewarm Catholic, and when he sees this, he sees this CT scan, and he's like, "What is this? What happened? What is the reaction?" So um, I would say that um, most doctors are not open to some of these really, treatments. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 So, um, and uh, I mean, there's really no, there's, there's no explanation. And um, they're, they are very surprised and um, they, they don't have any explanation for some of these healings. Did it ever happen? Did you ever experience that one of these doctors says, wow, you know, um, who, who it deepened their faith or, or it um, brought them to the church? or I've not seen any doctors that, have, that yeah. has deepened their faith, although, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that as time goes on, that's going to happen more. Um, I, I think that um, within the, the encounter sort of family, there are more and more medical professionals that are opening themselves up to what's happening, and um, I, I think that's going to continue to grow. Um, I mean, God wants to work in our lives. He wants to break into our lives and um, give us these gifts. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's going to happen more and more. It's beautiful. I also, we have the warning from Jesus. I mean, it just came to my mind right now. Jesus says, you know, when uh, I think it's the... Uh, the parable of uh, Lazarus and mm. the, the rich man who, um, when the rich man says, you know, please send, send Lazarus to my brothers so that he could see. And then Jesus said, they're very, very stern words. I mean, mm. um, even if someone rose from the dead, they, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't believe it. So, I, so I'll, I was asking if, some, if one of these doctors, after seeing a miraculous healing, um, did they convert or did they ask? Well, There's a, there is a story we just mm -hmm. um, are documenting right now mm -hmm from a doctor, not from Tony's hospital, but in Texas, where his daughter had um, ulcerative colitis, a digestive issue, and then um, she also had lupus. Okay. And he was a gastrointestinal doctor, and uh, he, he was actually um, involved with her treatment team. She was taking like a bag of pills every week, um, just so much yeah. medicine. She attended one of, one of our, our encounter conferences online. She was in Texas. This was in Michigan. And during the uh, healing service, we integrated it for an online audience and then invited those that were online to, if they were together with another person, to receive prayer and to, to, to do the corporate prayer that was happening. Her husband, who was at the time an alcoholic and not interested in following Jesus at all, felt this, this uncontrollable desire to actually pray put his hand on his wife and said the words that Father Matthias was inviting people to respond a healing prayer. And she felt heat go all the way through her body into her stomach, especially. And she also had, um, it was involving, it was creating uterine problems. They were about to take her uterus out the next month. She was only 25, very young. 
to make a long story short, um, the, the next month she was completely healed of lupus, ulcerative colitis, and all of the uterine issues were completely healed. We, after um, one and a half years, followed up and asked if we could document what was happening. And her father, the doctor, went on, a, uh, went on our, our, our film and, and it actually went on to admit that he did not believe as a Catholic in supernatural healing until his daughter was healed. And it completely changed his life and also a lot of the other doctors involved. So we have seen good things happen, but it's not like it's not a guarantee. Yeah, I, I think I think till Christ's second coming. Yeah, you know, mm. I, I believe in Christ's words that you know there's some people who are just not gonna not gonna accept it. You know, nah. I wanted to also ask, um, coming back to the healings um, with our people who are going to be watching this podcast, and I'm gonna have a question, especially for priests who are going to be watching this. Um, someone's watching now who's very sick, has a diagnosis, um, wants to come for healing. What would be some of the barriers that someone has? You say God wants to heal this person, mm -hmm. but there's some kind of barrier. Yeah. And what would be some of the, what could you concretely say? Yeah, three um, I, I, three to, things. For, for people listening. Yeah. Um, it, okay, God, God, God is so, sovereign. He, he could do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, to who he wants, right? Mm -hmm. But... In the gospel, we see that you know he wants our um, he wants to work with us. You know, so yeah. he tells he tells that guy in Siloam, go wash over there. You know, um, he takes he takes his spittle and and the earth and it makes the mud and puts it in the eyes and he asks, do you believe? So he wants us to do something. Okay, even though God could just come down and zap us and heal us, right? But it seems like from my reading of the gospel that God wa wants some kind of cooperation from us. Yeah. So what could be those? Uh, barriers that God wants to do this, but we're not yeah. letting him. There, well, there's, and, there's, sorry, just to yeah. let, let, jump in once more. And we know the famous thing in Nazareth, you know, not, when Jesus came home, he came home to his place, you know, and he says he, he healed very little people because there's no faith over there. So what would be some personal barriers that we may have that do not let God um, be God in our lives? Yeah, I'd say three things. Um, one is unforgiveness. Okay. Two is unrepentant sin three is control 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 giving up control and surrender so unforgiveness jesus said unless you forgive your brother for the sins he's committed against you neither will my father forgive you and so there's this we actually are uh, or we're responsible for forgiving those who have wounded and hurt us and unforgiveness holding on to unforgiveness to our brothers is a is a, a, a wall that we put up wall. that yeah. about preventing his grace which can be physical healing from coming through. So at our healing services, before we pray for healing, um, after the preaching, we will routinely lead a corporate prayer for the Holy Spirit to show if there's any unforgiveness for anyone there. Okay. The second one is, is sin. Sin is an obvious... Habitual um, sin, like unrepentant sin. Unrepentant yeah. sin um, is, is an obvious roadblock where we know what we're doing and we want, we, we want to follow our way and not God's way. And so we give an opportunity for those that come to our services to ask the Holy Spirit to, to show if there's any sin that they need to repent of repent and just do that. And, and we're talking simple prayers of, um, of repentance. Jesus, I'm so sorry for this. Uh, thank you for forgiving me. Help me to sin no more. And then if, if it's a mortal sin issue, like we invite people to you know, go to confession later okay. on. But he loves just the simple just the contrition, yeah. and then control. Like I want, I I control. I want my life the way I want it. I, I I don't want to surrender and follow Jesus. When we have this, when we're holding on, when we're holding on to what we have, it's like the the, the fist. Like I'm holding on to the little I have. When I'm doing that, I can't receive, and so I, I need open hands to receive. So we invite people that are coming to our services to to surrender their life to Jesus, to make that that leap of faith, and what that does is that positions you for faith to receive. Now all faith, every time um, individuals were coming to Jesus for, for healing, how did he respond to them after they were healed? Do you know, Father? Uh, go and sin no more, many times. He, he would say, go, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith okay. has healed you. Okay. So he actually honored their faith, faith believing, the, yeah. the, the believing they could be healed. And so what the faith, or the all healing flows through faith. And so, what that does, un, you know, forgiveness, um, repentance, surrender, that actually um, disposes me to receive faith 
that he can heal me. Because I can't, those things cannot earn me a healing. I can do all of these things and still not be healed. It is always a gift. It's but a gift. We yeah. have confidence yeah. that when we, when we position ourselves to receive, we can receive the gift of faith for the healing that he already wants to give us. Okay. Okay. And obviously, coming back to that topic, I think, um, I, I, you know, I'm trying to, I'm thinking with my Catholic mindset here, you know, um, I, I accept Jesus Christ, that he's alive, and he gave the mandate to the disciples in Matthew 28 and other places to go and heal, and healings are happening. But then, you know, I don't want to go into another extreme, which is, um, it's another topic I want to talk about, which is not that present in Croatia, but I've seen it with some... Uh, either priest or lay um, evangelists, um, the, the so-called prosperity gospel, health and wealth gospel, which would basically be, you know, uh, my, uh, my health and my wealth and my prosperity here on earth is a sign that I'm on God's side, that God loves me. Um, and, you know, you got guys like Joel Osteen, Reverend Dyke, and other guys who are, you know, um, speaking about these things and we, we got regular Catholics who are watching these things who don't have the filter and, and, then, and then they fall into this kind of trap or temptation where saying, you know, God, you know, something, something's wrong. God doesn't love me because a physical healing or any miracle um, has to follow up, has to follow up on my faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how would you reconcile? The, just so we could go in this, yeah. in this golden middle way, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty yeah. easy. I mean, Healing is Jesus' idea, and we want to approach it the way he approached it and the way that he invited us to do it. And the, the commands for healing were always in the context of the preaching of the gospel. So it's the gospel message which is the most important thing. If the gospel is the key of salvation. And so Jesus uh, instructed us, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And then a few verses later uh, in Mark's gospel, it says that the disciples went forth from there Preaching the gospel, where you know, to preaching the gospel, and uh, what, and it was confirmed, and it was dem, uh, and it was accompanied by uh, confirming signs. So the, the proclamation of the gospel has to be key. So at Encounter, we teach healing in the context of proclaiming the gospel message. In the prosperity gospel, there is this emphasis on healing for its own sake, and okay. when healing is for its own sake it becomes very twisted. And what is the gospel? It's ultimately the ultimate relationship with a God that's, that loves you so much, with a, that sin has only begotten the Son, Jesus, and it wants to unite you with the Holy Spirit, and He has good plans for your life. And so every time we do healing services, we're always preaching the good news of Jesus. And it's in that context that faith is reawoken. Even if I've always believed this, when I see a healing yeah. in the context of that, it increases, increases my faith your, even yeah, more. It your faith, yeah. And it's so sad. We do have friends in ministry uh, and other theological perspectives that they, they put their, their, their value is in how many healings they've seen in the last week. Yeah. And it's a, a, a sick kind of performance. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the Pharisees, they were, they were so convinced about their performance, what they do for God, that there can be a charismatic Pharisaical performance. How many? Charismatic Pharisaic. Yeah, Matthew yeah. seven twenty one. Yeah. Jesus said, yeah. uh, "Not all, not all who, who who cry out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven." And on that day, they'll say, "Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't, didn't we, we cast, cast out, out demons? demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name?" I always and know what that, that, me, that gospel scares me a little bit because and you just interrupted you, it. Yeah. But I was going to yeah, forgive so go you, ahead, Father. Go ahead, go I was going to forgive go you. Go for it. Go for it. And 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 he went on to say, <laughs> uh, "Depart from me. I never knew you." Wow. And, and if, if we do all these things outside of the ultimate relationship, we can be in, in the in threat of being those that, that did the supernatural without knowing him. That's why all fruitful ministry flows out of intimacy and relationship, which is the gospel. Yeah. Now you can interrupt. I think, I think that's, that's one of the reasons. Well, I remember as a student theology, and we had biblical theology in those courses, and we, we, we were dealing with, uh, in the gospel, the phenomenon of the messianic secret. So Jesus would heal someone and say, don't say anything to anyone, you know, mm -hmm. don't. But, but then after, you know, he sends them out into the world. So what I remember commenting on that um, is because the full paschal mystery was not manifested yet and the kingdom had not been revealed. So Jesus did not want these people looking at these miracles um, separate from his paschal mystery and, and the kingdom. But even later, he would send them out and, you know, to witness and there's, there's another interpretation this mm -hmm. comes from dr mary healy she's on okay. our 
our curriculum review board for our school, and she's also on the Pontifical uh, Biblical Commission. She okay. was the first uh, Woman. female theologian appointed to the Pontifical Biblical mm -hmm. Commission. In her commentary on the uh, Mark's Gospel, uh, early in Mark, there was a healing of a blind man. I think it was in Mark chapter 1, and it, it, it drew such a crowd that it says he could no longer enter the towns. So then it went forth. So Mary, Mary, Dr. Mary Healy's interpretation was, Jesus' command to a lot of people not to share that was a logistical one. Logistical. Yeah, it was logistical because he couldn't even get in to preach the gospel because there would be so many crowds. Interesting. Yeah. I've never heard of that take, but it, it sounds uh, logical. It, yeah, worth following up on. <laughs> uh, Doctor, uh, what, okay, I, I know, Patrick, you're full-time yeah. in the encounter ministry, so mm -hmm. you and Father Matthias are full-time there. Uh, Dr. Tony, what, what is your role? You're a doctor that you obviously work full-time, you have a family. Right, um, right. What's your role in the encounter ministry? So I'm a graduate of the school. So okay. the Encounter School is um, is a two year commitment, um, and every Monday, you know, once a week, it's a th mm -hmm. three hours a night, and it's just sort of a deep dive into okay. all these teachings. Mm -hmm. And at this point, um, I'm not involved in Encounter Ministries except, um, you know, from time to time. Of course, I'll I'll um, be a part of, uh, you know, the events that occur. Um, in our parish or at the Encounter School, and um, you know, uh, I just uh, um, I'm in, I'm involved that way, and I I just basically I feel like I've been equipped to step out and bring, as Patrick said, what I've learned to those that I encounter in my life. Okay, so that's sort of my he's living. You know, he's a he's a okay. model graduate, okay. and his or his uh, medical background makes him a big asset for oh, those that definitely. are having a hard time. Yeah. One thing we're passionate to encounter is this phrase, bringing the best of Jesus and the best of medicine. Because as you approach supernatural healing, you see Jesus can do all these things supernaturally like he did. Why do we even need medicine? And the answer is they both go together. And we need to be a church that brings the best of both. Okay. And the fact that Tony's doing that in his practice as a surgeon is a, a testimony that we want to get out into... Um, our, uh, we're doing a healing school here tomorrow, um, and so we want Tony to share testimonies and uh, and to let everyone see the bigger picture. Wow. Um, so you're full-time. How many people are involved full-time in the Encounter Ministry? Uh, we have 15 full-time employees, and then we have about uh, 25 part-time employees. And what is the relationship with the Encounter Ministry with the, the official hierarchical Catholic Church in America? Yeah, we're, we're officially recognized in our Diocese of Lansing. Okay. And everywhere we have a satellite campus, uh, we require the local leaders of a satellite campus to uh, get a letter of welcome from their local bishop. So all 23 satellite campuses um, have gone through a vetting process with their local bishops to get approval. And so they're they're officially recognized, and they're they're walking with the hierarchy. Excellent, yeah. excellent. I, I ask that because um, you know, Croatia is predominantly a Catholic country, and uh, from the literature, I, I am a spiritual director of a charismatic Catholic uh, youth prayer group called Božja Pobida, which would translate into God's victory. God's yeah, I heard victory. I heard they have a good podcast. <laughs> yeah. Excellent podcast, yeah. Yeah. world renowned. <laughs> Um, and um, mo like I follow the literature also. I mean, uh, we got YouTube, and and it seems like the healing mis ministry is um, it's a monopoly of the evangelical and Pentecostal denominational churches. And God bless them for that. I mean, they're they're doing great things too. You know, um, why is it why is it that um, you know why is it that within the framework of the institutional Catholic Church? that there's a kind of like apprehension and and it's true i mean let's look at the numbers it's a, it's a um the healing ministry mostly predominantly is within the confines of evangelical pentecostal um we have thanks be to god you know um neil lozano the work damien stein he was in croatia i met him a, you, encounter you know i i encountered you guys <laughs> encounter about a year ago when my friends uh shared a link and i, I watched i watched the um the documentary, but I, I get a feeling that's just little sparks. You know, it's mm -hmm. not a, um, it's not, it's not a, it's 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 not that present within our Catholic Church. Why do you think that is so? 
Um, there's a lot of reasons. I don't know if we have time to, to dive into all of the elements of that, but um, I think there's there's perceptions and there's realities. Okay. And there's a, I think what you're describing is more a perception of our history than the reality. Mm. And um, like once again, I wrote this book, Supernatural Saints, because there are so many Catholic saints, saints. that have are that in their time were famous for healing, but in a lot of the biographies that were written about them or popularizations, they've kind of been omitted for I don't know why. But for example, St. Catherine of Siena, she's known, all I knew her for for so long was she was the woman that she had mystical encounters with Jesus and told the Pope to move back to Rome. Reprimanded the Pope from yeah. Avion to Rome, yeah. And uh, But what I didn't know is she was most famous in her time for her deliverance ministry and healed, supernaturally healed so many sick people, especially of the plague that was going on at the time. And there's so many accounts of that. The fact that they're not being, uh, that these are, are not well known is very unfortunate, but the charisms, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, these are our heritage. These are not Pentecostal aberrations. I, I, I agree. And totally. so we need to, for us, we're, we want to take it back. Take it back. And I push back against some of those um, perspectives or uh, you know, storylines. I don't believe it's true. And when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you're rich and when you're deep in history, you're fully Catholic. And so I, we believe there's a lot of catechesis that needs to be done. And in the same way that Pope John Paul II brought the theology of the body, which is That's it, not theology new. Of the body. That's my topic. Right, yeah. I was just, That's my topic. Yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't new. It, it's been around for, you know, the, the key teachings are ancient, yeah. but they're so new. And like, like Augustine said, oh, beauty is so ancient and old, but it's so new to me. This is like the gifts of the Spirit, um, especially healing ministry. It's so old. We've been doing this for 2,000 years, but it, it, the experience is so new. You know, uh, talking about theology of the body, I I, um, I studied at CUA and at the JP2 Second Institute for, for Family in Washington, D.C., and that's where I encountered theology of the body. I came back, and I had my first seminar like 2008. Flocks of young people coming, mm -hmm. and a lot of these people saying, Father, why don't why don't we know this? What like, well, to be honest with you, this has been here since it's been the here. gospel. Yes. It's you know, the first century. You read you read John of Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, Saint Augustine, uh, it'd make you blush, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, when he talks about marriage and the marital act. Um, but yeah, so I, so you're you you claim it's it's a sense of perception. So perception. it's there. Yeah. Yeah. When when you do the study and the um you understand that your perception of ca you know Catholic tradition is not actually the full perception that our, our, our church, our faith, is supernatural ministry. That Jesus actually is the standard of all ministry. Yeah. Not what I'm currently seeing in the world. Yeah. So the ideal, who, what's, the, what's the normal Catholic? The normal Catholic is not um, the saint that you like. The, the, the most normal Catholic is Jesus. And once again, what did Jesus do? Like that one. He preached the gospel. <laughs> he demonstrated it with supernatural signs. Healing being the most common one. So if Jesus valued healing that much, how much should we value healing? Yeah. And that's a decision we all have to make. And, and we've chosen to value healing the way he valued it. And I think it's a huge injustice done to a lot of saints. I, I'll, I'll start with our Don Bosco. You oh, know, yeah. You read Don Bosco, you got, you got some uh, biographies of him just showing him as a, as a pedagogue, as an educator, as a teacher, a guy who wrote textbooks, and he did write textbooks. He wrote, he, he drew contracts with young people back then. Like he was the first one to kind of represent young people um, in the, doing the trades with these companies, construction companies in the 19th century. But there's a whole other mystical side of him. Mm -hmm. He's a miracle worker, he was charismatic, uh, he had the gifts, and, and I've read some biographies, they just leave that out, they just leave yeah. that out, you know? They, it's like they, they don't want that side, it's humanistic and everything, but that's a good, that's a good take, it's part of perception. Now one, one other thing I wanted to talk about is the connection between our sacramental life, sacraments, and the healing ministry. Um, we, we priests, obviously, um, we put a lot of stress on the sacramental life here in Croatia, for example. I, I always talk about confession and, and the Eucharist and adoration. Um, in your healing ministry, um, do you find how, um, you, like Father Matthias, obviously, he's a priest too. So um, what I want to ask is the connection between the two. Yeah. Will you guys have, for example, a service for, um, the, for the sacrament of, of the sick? 
Um, do you guys ask people to go to confession before you pray for them if there's a sin involved? Or how do you connect the sacraments with your healing ministry? So there's, it, it's really simple. There's multiple, there's different modes okay. that Jesus can heal. And there's, there's really, if you break down all the different ways and modes that healing can happen, there's four. Uh, intercession, just me asking God to bring, to release the grace of healing. There's prayers of, of command where Jesus rebuked the fever over Peter's mother-in-law yeah. with authority and the fever departed. There is, uh, there's acts, we call them prophetic acts, where there's something done in obedience to the Holy Spirit, like the putting of spittle in the man's eyes. Nothing about the, the mud naturally could bring forth the healing, but Jesus was following the promptings of the Father to do that and it released the healing. And then fourthly is the anointing with oil according to proper liturgical rites, the anointing of the sick. Um, so healing can happen in, in any way. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, at, our, at, at Encounter, we're mostly equipping, we, we equip all people, but you can't equip lay people to do the anointing of the sick. Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. So at our, at our services, we're focusing on um, non-sacramental modes of healing. There are, we, our job is to make sure that our, in, in our parishes, in our culture, there is a lot of opportunities to receive anointing. There's not a lot of opportunities to be prayed for in the other ways. And okay. so because it's so prevalent and predominant, at least in our culture, we don't really need to do a lot of that. Um, but one interesting thing is in the, the life, once again, of St. Philip Neri, there are a lot of stories of people receiving anointing of the sick, not being healed, and then Philip Neri praying for, praying for them with non-sacramental means of healing, mostly prayers of command. Uh, that was actually, there is a whole chapter in Father Bocci's biography of him, quote titled, of all of the miracle, of all of the healing miracles uh, Philip Neri did through commanding the disease to leave. It was very prevalent. So Philip Neri actually had no stories of him anointing someone and they actually getting healed. But when Philip Neri was sick, he had everyone praying for him, didn't get healed until he was anointed. Really? <laughs> and it was the anointing of the sick that brought him healing. A big picture, what I'm trying to, to communicate is healing is a mystery. How I'm healed, I don't get to choose. Yeah. I could go and get uh, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick and not be healed and then have the little old lady in the pew lay hands on me and say a prayer and I'm healed. I don't really care how it happens. I just want it to happen. Okay. And with the, uh, you, you mentioned confession, disposition. Mm -hmm. We, at the beginning, um, we, we go through the blocks of healing and we'll, we'll, we'll have opportunities for um, simple repentance. And then we'll counsel people um, to, to go to, to act the actual sacrament of confession, but we can't facilitate that logistically with the large crowds that we have during a healing service. Yeah. Now, I, we, I heard um, Dr. Dr. Tony shared um, your, your experience, your mystical experience mm. that you had at, 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 their, at the encounter. Um, one other question for the both of you is, uh, did you guys experience any healing in your life, a physical oh, yeah. healing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you share that with us? Absolutely. I've had multiple healings. The last one I had was my, um, through my daughter, Gianna. So my, 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 my children, Emily, my wife and I, we have physical healing as a culture in our family. So our children have this worldview. They, they see so many healings. We bring them to the healing service. They see it all the time. And so they have so much faith, sometimes even more faith than we feel like we have at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I had, I injured my right knee. I tweaked the uh, my ACL and some of the cartilage around it. And every time I put weight on it, I had pain in my knee. And I said, hey guys, can you, my, to my family, can you come please pray over my knee? And they all started praying. And my, uh, my seven-year-old, uh, she came up and uh, put her finger on that and said, knee be healed right now in Jesus' name. Really? Check it out. And I moved it around and all the pain was completely gone. Wow. It was incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah. Tony? Personally, I haven't had any healing, but people in my family have, and um, it's beautiful to see. And I, I think that with with our kids, like like Patrick's kids, you know, it just increases faith, and um, it, it's um, it's something that, again, um, I through my training, um, I've had to come to terms with, but I'm completely comfortable with. Um, the idea that God wants to break into our lives, heal our, heal us, 
um, physically, yeah. and you know, more importantly, spiritually. Because again, physical healing is is temporary, but spiritual healing is is most important. I, I kind of think back to the the parable of or the story of the lepers, the, the lepers that Jesus healed, and then one came back to him. Um, and um, and it's it's that coming back to Christ ultimately that's most important. So good. Yeah. You mentioned something very interesting. Culture of healing. Mm -hmm. Now I've heard we heard the expression culture of life, um, culture of death on the opposite side. Um, and I I listened to a witness of an Af a bishop from Africa who was just mentioning how so many miracles are happening over there. You know, places like Africa, Asia, uh, where the church is either a minority, um, persecuted, pure, or um, poor, or um, just the disposition of the people who are um, so open to the um, extraordinary, the, the supernatural. And I listened to his witness. I think, I think, it was a witness I heard from uh, the Archbishop of New York that he was talking to a bishop. And the bishop was saying, you know, miracles are happening in our countries amongst our people because we believe. Mm -hmm. And we're here in the West, Western Europe, where um, numerically, if anything, is just not happening that much. Do you, do you think it has to do with that, that, that expression you use, culture of healing? I, I think culture has a lot to do with it. Okay. I think uh, culture is defined by what you celebrate and what you won't tolerate. And when you celebrate the, the healings, and that be, that, that's something that's celebrated, it, it shifts the culture. And yeah. so in our, in our family, we celebrate healings. We should, mostly through testimony. When we talk about what Jesus has done, it, it creates a culture and a, and a faith for healing. Um, yeah, and so testimonies are, are really important to us. And so if you go on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, You'll just see a lot of testimonies of people yeah. sharing their story. This is what happened. This was my condition. This is what I experienced. I felt when someone prayed for me. Here's what I can do now, and I'm going to thank Jesus for that. So when I feast and I on what God's doing, it increases my faith and the faith of the world around me. Yeah, I I had a deep conversion when I was 16 through um, something miraculous. I was at a priest uh, who. Uh, I went to confession, not because I wanted to, the priests, and we went to a Catholic high school, and they basically told us whoever goes to confession will get two hours off from school, so we all went to That's confession. That's a sweet deal. <laughs> That's yeah. a sweet deal. Yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't go to confession, eh? Um, and then um, he spoke words of knowledge to me, and I was 16, and mm -hmm. I I knew that this there's no way this guy knew some things about me, my personal life, and the, the state of my soul, and whatnot. Um, and that, that that's the beginning of my my a small a small miracle for me it was a big miracle and and uh, so I could see where you know the, uh, testimony um, eyewitness testimony can, can really change hearts oh yeah and if you look at actually the the homily of Saint Peter on Pentecost Day and all the homilies that either Paul or Peter said in, in the Acts they're, they're very saying we saw him he's alive mm -hmm. you know so it, it's all testimony I think that's so important okay one um, one final thing. Uh, I want you to say something to our priests. Yeah. Okay. I'm a priest of 20 years. So this year I celebrated 20 years ordination. Um, here in Croatia, uh, like I said, we're predominantly a Catholic culture. Um, and we have a lot of good priests, a lot of young guys in evangelization and whatnot. But like I said, I'll be honest, um, the, the, the culture of healing is not present here, definitely. Um, we do have priests who definitely pray and we're open to that. What would you say to a priest, a Catholic priest, um, who, who's ordained, who, who believes, um, but is kind of hesitant um, and has an apprehension to praying? I, I'm one of them. I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I pray now more for, for healings. Like, I'll pray. You know, when someone comes to me, Father, you know, I have cancer or I have depression. So one's a state of the soul, another is a physical. I'll pray for them. I'll pray for them. Um, so I'm, I, I've got to that stage where I'm open, but I, I have to admit, I, I still have that um, apprehension a little bit, yeah. you know, J just because 
um, you know, God, you know, I, I don't want this to fail. I don't want to embarrass you, you know. <laughs> so I, maybe it's better not to pray because I know deep down or I think I know that nothing will happen anyways. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I summed up the average priest. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe not. I'm, I'm just talking from my corner here. Like, what yeah. would you say to a priest? You know, I, I, if I can yeah. just speak first, I, I can completely understand what yeah. that added. That's exactly where I was five years ago. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, I was pulled into this sort of kicking and screaming. Like, really? I, <laughs> I did not want to accept this for what it was, but I have seen so much over the last number of years that I can't but not accept it as truth. And again, my... My prayer is just, God, show me truth. That's mm -hmm. it, in my heart. And um, I, I would say, um, I get it. But just ask God to guide you and ask God to show you truth. That's so good. That, that's, yeah. been, that's your whole story too, Tony. That's, I mean, that's my yeah, whole story. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's much more comfortable for me to not be involved in, in these physical healings through prayer just as a physician, but I can't not be involved based on what I've seen. And I'll leave it at that. I would say two things. Um, I'd say to any priest, I'd say, Father, there is more. There is so much more mm -hmm. that he wants to give you. And uh, when you press into that, it's, it's an incredible journey. And ultimately, when, when, whenever we are worried about something not happening or embarrassing ourselves, we're making it about us. Yeah, and healing a, is never a, about, about us. Again, yeah. It's about Him, and wherever there's fear, that's an opportunity for, for to identify where Jesus wants to bring His love. Because there's no no love, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. So it's an invitation to say, "Wow, Jesus, let Your perfect love come in here, so it's no longer about me." And that creates that invitation for Him to show you the way, mm -hmm. and to do what Jesus did. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, guys, at the end. Uh, what what are some new projects? What's going on um, in the le next couple of months um, in terms of the ministry and counter yeah. ministry? Do you guys have some kind of uh, vision, mission, uh, some new ideas? Um, yeah, we do. Yeah. We have a, um, at the end of December, okay. December 20th to 30th in Grand Rapids, Michigan, we're having our annual encounter conference. And we're expecting over 5,000 people to come from all over the world to uh, encounter Jesus, to be built up to experience uh, more of the Holy Spirit and empowerment in their life. We're bringing speakers from uh, some of the, the best leaders in the renewal, um, from, and also some, some non-Catholic brothers and sisters that we're in relationship with to receive from. That's happening at the end of December. And then there's a, uh, a satellite, cam there's satellite campuses that are planning to launch in Austria, in Salzburg and Vienna. So I'll be going to um, Salzburg and Vienna over two weeks to, to minister and lead seminars and events to, to prepare for, uh, for their, the launch of their schools. And then we have, um, we have a, we're having a conference, our first Spanish conference in Mexico. So we'll be going to Mexico City in April to lead a Spanish encounter conference, which I'm very excited about. The church in Latin America is so primed and ready for the power of the Holy Spirit to come and for the people to, to, be pressing into the ministry of Jesus. Yeah. Okay, now you 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 um, I'm opening up another topic. I was going to finish, but uh, you you mentioned satellite campuses in Salzburg and Vienna. You said mm -hmm. right? Okay, that's very close to Croatia. Um, what has to happen for <laughs> yeah. what happens? To hap what has to happen for a satellite campus to open up? Like, what yeah, does that so, mean? So in uh, between January and March, okay. on our EncounterSchool.org website, we launch applications for. Leaders of local, uh, mostly communities, like okay. prayer communities okay. or uh, local ministries that have a desire, that, that share our vision for equipping, that have a call to equip the church around them to, um, to, to do the works of Jesus and greater works. Okay. And so we, we partner with, there's an application process, a discernment to learn more about um, our curriculum and what we do. And then we have an online training program for leaders. And so the leaders will go through at least one year initially of our online encounter school campus to learn about that. Right now it's in English, Spanish, and French. And so they would go through that and that would help them discern the process. And then uh, there's a, a period of having to 
petition their local ordinary, their bishop, bishop yeah. to get permission. And, um, and then we do further training with lo local leaders. A lot of what I do for Encounter Ministries is working with the satellite campus leaders. And so, yeah, there's an official discernment process between applications between January and March, discernment, and then a, a, a one-year formation training program before they're able to launch. And then wherever we're launching a campus, we will do a launch event. So we'll bring our leaders to pour into okay. that community there. And along with all the, okay, these places, these cities where these satellite campuses, all along parallel, you guys have the online campus. Yeah. So someone could literally... Uh, join in a cycle online, a yeah. two-year cycle, if I understood. Yeah, it's it's not ideal. What we do is, is best done uh, in an live. incarnational yeah, live. Definitely, um, but yeah. where that's not possible, you can do it online, and there's tremendous fruit from that. Mm -hmm. um, but our desire is is to be uh, pe people to be in person. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Guys, thanks. Thank you so much. Can, this... can, I, can I pray for the audience, Father? Uh, definitely. Yeah, all right. Definitely. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Spirit. Amen. amen. Jesus, I thank you that you love to heal, that you have good plans. You're a good Father, and that you want, <laughs> you want more of your Holy Spirit. So I just got a sense, Father, that there's people that are watching. Someone has, uh, maybe multiple people, pain in their right shoulder that Jesus actually wants to heal. So in the name of Jesus, I speak to any pain or weakness, uh, infirmity in right shoulders, I command you to be healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And also as I was sharing the testimony about the woman that had abdominal issues and digestive issues, I got a strong sense of the Holy Spirit that, um, that there's people listening that have, um, that have pain or digestive issues that he wants to bring healing. So I just wanna pray once again, Father, I thank you that you love to heal the stomach, the digestive tracts, and I ask you to send your Holy Spirit to anoint um, stomachs, digestive tracts, to clear out anything that's blocking uh, the full functioning of the digestive organs to function the way that Jesus designed you. I thank you, Father, in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, thanks. Thank you so much. This was uh, very eye-opening for me. I mean, I, I admit we decided before what we're going to talk about, but a lot of things opened up, and um, it was a blessing for me as a priest to. Uh, Thank you for honoring us with yeah, the invitation yeah. and to share. I just want to share how how um, how beautiful it is uh, for everything you're doing, and me as a priest, um, and for coming to Croatia, to Zagreb, and. Uh, also, the witness of your families. I think we left them off to the side a little bit, but you know, God bless you for being opening to life, open to life, and your kids and your wives. And I thank the wives for letting you guys come. Okay, Amen. so yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to, to, to come like this with so many children. And um, you'll be in our prayers. And thank you, Father. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe one day we'll have a satellite uh, campus here in Croatia. Okay, so I don't know. Maybe there's, some, there's something burning inside of me. Maybe. I'll, I'll believe with you for that. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'm believing with you for that. Okay. Okay, uh, evo dragi gledatelji, uh, evo sve ste čuli, uh, Marina ćemo dovesti natrag. Ovaj, meni je bilo super, ja nisam trebao biti opterećen s našim pa, ovim hrvatskim padežem, prekrasan hrvatski, još uvijek tvrdim da je hrvatski jezik puno ljepši od engleskog jezika. Bog vas blagoslovio i nastavite pratiti ovaj naš BP podcast. Bog vas blagoslovio.